So let's look at the last lecture in Unit 6, and this is valence shell electron parapulsion. Um, and so when we look at this, we call this VESPER. And so we're going to jump into this, the learning goals. Students will predict the shape of molecules based on shared electrons in lone pairs. And secondly, we'll understand the effects of molecular shape on stability and reactivity. So basically now, we know what the empirical molecular formula are, how we get covalent formulas. We know how to name covalent formulas. We know percent composition. And we know what covalent bonds are. Now we're going to look at, well, why are they shaped the way that they are? So what we already know. Atoms can bond together to form compounds, and atoms vary in the number of bonds they can form. And this clinch here, we think Coulomb's law on effective nuclear charge. And for us, we want to think opposites attract, and so like repel. So what we learned in the lab is the electron bonds repel each other in the same way that electrons do. And the shape of molecules is determined by the electron repulsion. So since opposites attract and likes repel, those electrons push each other away. And that's essentially what Coulomb's law is, is that we learn before, um, we learn before that like charges repel. And electrons, including um, bonds, want to keep as far away as possible as they can. And this determines the, the geometry. So electrons, in trying to get away from each other, really determine the shape of a molecule. So electronic geometry, the geometry of electron domains around a central atom. And electron domains include uh, pairs of electrons, so that's an electron domain and bonded electrons, and these are electron domains. And the one trick here is that double and triple bonds are one electron domain. Now what happens is these lone pairs really push on a bond and they push those hydrogens essentially down to make them in the shape that they are, which is a bent shape. Now what VESPER is, is it stands for valence shell electron parapulsion and it predicts molecular geometry based on valence electrons. So electrons repel, moving bonds as far away from possible, and the lone pairs push away more than the bonded electrons. So just like in water, these since these electrons are negative, they're pushing these guys away, and they get as far away from each other as possible. So what we have is we have different types of shapes. Now, if there are two bonds are present, um, they will repel each other. So if we have a central atom with only two electron domains, we have a linear shape, which is a straight line. So two bonds are present on the central atom, or two electron domains, we have a straight line. If there are two bonds with lone pairs, meaning there are two bonds, but we have four electron domains, like in ox or water, we see we have only two bonds, but we have four electron domains, what we will have is we will have this bent shape. An example of this is we have our water, which we just saw. So it'll take this shape because you got two lone pairs sitting on top pushing it down. So if two bonds are present um, with lone pairs, um, then they will repel each other and make this bent shape. If we have three bonds are present, or three, just three electron domains around the central atom, we have a what we call a trigonal planar shape. An example of this we boron trichloride. Um, if we have four electron domains but only three of them are bonds, what we're going to have is we're going to have a trigonal pyramidal shape. If we have four bonds are present um, and they will four electron domains and we have four bonds, we're always going to get a tetrahedral shape. And it's going to give us a bond angle of this. And basically our bond angles when we're looking at these, that's as far away as they can get from each other. Now we'll look at a question. It says, using the clear method, explain the molecular geometry of water as bent and not tetrahedral. So when we're looking at this, we have oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, oxygen. So this is the Lewis structure that we would draw. And the reason why we know that it's bent is because it has four electron domains, but 
two of them are going to be lone pairs. And so it pushes those hydrogens down, which make it a bent shape. Okay, so let's predict the molecular geometry, the predict the polarity and molecular geometry of NH3. So polarity, remember we talked about that earlier, it's if something has a difference in electronegativity. And we want the molecular geometry. So the first step in this is we have to write the Lewis structure of NH3. So when we're doing this, we put nitrogen in the middle, hydrogen around it, we're given this shape. And then what we look at is we look at valence electrons. So nitrogen will have five, hydrogen, we have three of them, each one has one, so three, three times one is three. So we have eight. So we go ahead and we bond, bond, bond. And we go eight minus each bond, remember, represents two, so two, four, six. We have a leftover of two. How many more does each hydrogen need? Well, none. How many more does nitrogen need? Two. Perfect. We have two left. One, two. So we want to predict the molecular geometry. Well, how many domains do we have? When we're looking at it, we have one, two, three, four. Four domains, and one of them is a lone pair. So when we're looking at this, what we're really saying is this lone pair is going to push these guys down. So if we have three domains that are bonded and one is a lone pair, we would call that trigonal pyramidal because that has four electrons domains, three things bonded to the atom, plus a lone pair. So that's trigonal pyramidal. Next, it says predict the polarity and the molecular geometry of CH4. So again, we put carbon in the middle, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen and we count the valence electrons. So carbon is going to give us four, plus our hydrogens, one apiece, so four more, so eight. So bond, 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 bond. We have eight. Each one of those bonds was two, so we got eight. Now we're down to zero. Well, good thing nobody needs anything. So when we're looking at this, how many electron domains we have? One, two, three, four. Four electron domains, none of them are lone pairs, so this is a tetrahedral shape. And we know that that carbon-hydrogen bond is going to be nonpolar. Let's look at our next one. It says predict the polarity and molecular geometry of CO2. So we have carbon in the middle, oxygen, oxygen. And so we look at it, carbon is going to supply four. Each oxygen is going to pro provide six valence electrons. Total of 12, we have 16. So bond, bond. 16 minus 4, because each bond represents 2, will give us 12. So how many does oxygen each oxygen need? 6. And that carbon needs 4. So 12 plus 4 is 16. Well, we only have 12 left. So what do we do? Double bond. Okay, so we make another bond. And that took care of 2. So minus 2, we're down to 10. So carbon only needs 2 more. Oxygen needs 4 more, that one over there. And this oxygen needs 6. 2 plus 4, that's 12. Well, we still don't have enough. So, bond. That minus 2, we're down to 8. So when we're looking at this, we go back and look. Well, carbon now needs 0. This carbon oxygen needs 4. That needs 4 for a total of 8. Hey, we have 8. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, when we're looking at the shape, just look at the electron domains around the central atom. So how many electron domains are there around carbon? One, two. Two electron domains around the central atom, no lone pairs, so guess what? This is going to be a linear shape. Remember that double bonds still only count as one electron domain. Now, what does all this mean, the shape and everything else? Well, the shape really has to do with reactivity. And what reactivity is, um, is just how something will react, how something will actually um, uh, interact with other molecules. And so the shape really of a molecule can help determine how molecules react. And the negative part of one molecule is attracted to another positive part. Um, and then the greater the number of bonds, the more difficult it is to access a central atom. So really the reason why we learned all about this shape was to look at, hey, how reactive can something be? And that really gives us an idea of what the shape really means.